We'll begin our exploration of secondary dominance with this pretty simple uh, chord progression here. So again, a very simple progression going from our tonic to our predominant four chord to a dominant five, which matures to a five seven by use of a passing seventh here. And then finally, of course, resulting in the tonic. What I'd like to do is I'd like to take um, each of these uh, middle harmonies, the four chord here and the five chord and show how secondary dominance can again kind of highlight or enhance their arrival. And we'll start with the five chord because that is typically the, the, the diatonic chord that's most likely to be treated with a secondary dominant. So here we are at a simplified version of the five chord. Uh, you'll see that I've done away with the chordal seventh for now, just to kind of make it a little simpler to explore how we can use a secondary dominant to arrive at this five chord. What I'd like to do for starters is just, at least mentally, forget about the harmonic context for just a second and just recognize that this is simply a G major chord. And so I can ask myself, okay, if I'm arriving at a G major chord, uh, for instance, if I were in the key of G, what chord or what dominant would, would I use to get to that G, right? So, of course, based on our understanding of relationships between chords and the dominants that lead to them, um, I can kind of imagine that I'm, I want to create a 5 in the context of G. So, of course, uh, just by knowing how the key of G works in the circle of fifths, I realize that in order to do that, I'm going to need a D major chord. Okay. And so what I'll do is, okay, I'll figure out, okay, how do I arrive at a G major chord from a D major chord? And I can kind of reverse engineer some of the voice leading things that I've done so far. Well, I know that the simplest thing to do would be to take the root of the, of the five chord or the five of G and take it to the G itself. So maybe the bass would have arrived there from a D. And if I think about the behavior of leading tones, I know that leading tones tend to resolve, tend to resolve to the root of, of the chord I'm headed towards. So the root of the chord is doubled here in the soprano. So maybe what I'll do is I'll precede that with an F sharp in the soprano. Okay, And so that gives me the root of the D major chord. And that also gives me the third of the D major chord. Okay, so I'll let, let's see if I can double the root, and of course if I double the root in the D major chord, that would allow me to simply carry that same note as a common tone to the D in the alto. So maybe I'll precede the alto's D with another D, and just treat that as a common tone. And then of course now all I need is the chordal fifth. So the chordal fifth is an A, which conveniently enough is simply a step below the B in the tenor. So perhaps I can use that as a secondary dominant to the G chord. So let's just hear what that sounds like in the abstract. Let's hear that again. Here's the D chord leading to the G chord. Now I know that my options for arriving at uh, this G triad aren't necessarily limited to using its, uh, its, its dominant chord as a triad. I can also use it as a seventh chord as well. So perhaps there's a way to make a five seven into G. And I've kind of done some of the legwork already. Uh, you see I've retained the F sharp, the leading tone. I've retained the doubled root here. And I've realized that if I put a chordal seventh in the tenor, then that chordal seventh will resolve nicely downward into the B, right? And of course that means I'll have an incomplete 5-7. Let's see what that sounds like. Here it is again with that D major seventh chord leading to the G chord. So now we see I've taken one of those secondary chords that, that, that I came up with and I've imported it into my original progression, placing it, of course, between the four chord and the five chord. We do want it to come just before the five because that's the, that, that's the chord that it's going to embellish. So as you can see now, uh, the C that I came up with actually works pretty well as a common tone coming from the C that had existed in the four chord in the tenor. And then the D that I came up with in the alto can be used to tie over or to carry over into the five chord itself. So let's see what that sounds like. Hear that is again and listen to how my uh, my new chord here really kind of uh, heightens or elevates or emphasizes the arrival of the G chord. One of the 
the things I now realize is that I should have labeled my one chord as an incomplete, so I've gone ahead and added that label here. So hopefully you hear how, again, this secondary dominant kind of uh, helps to, again, highlight the arrival of, 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 the, uh, of the G major chord here. Now, what do we label this thing? right? Uh, within the context of just a G major chord kind of in the abstract, it was just a 5 of G. But we're not in the key of G here, so we can't really call it a 5 chord within this context unless we specify that it's a 5 chord according to uh, the chord it's arriving to. So that's where we come up with this label. It is a 5 chord, but only if I'm interpreting it within the key of the five that it arrives to. So we call this a five of five. And in fact, since it's a seventh chord, we'll call it a five seven of five. And so this can be a little bit con confusing because you've got the same Roman numeral on the top and on the bottom here. So just recognize that the top Roman numeral, this one, the five or five seven or whatever your secondary chord is, refers to the nature of this harmony that I've written within the context or as interpreted within this diatonic pitch. So the chord on the bottom is going to be is going to name one of the diatonic pitches within our home key, right? And the Roman numeral on the top talks about how this chord operates within that that, that diatonic chords uh, kind of home context, so to speak. So in this case, I would call this a five seven of five. So diatonic uh, five chords are, are kind of the most common ones in terms of uh, whether or not we'll treat them with a secondary dominant, but they're not the only candidate. So let's explore that using the four chord from my original progression. So again, I'll just kind of forget that it's a four chord for a second and just call it an F major chord, okay? And I'll have to kind of remind myself, okay, well, what is the dominant to an F major chord? If I were pretending to be within the key of F, what chord would I use to get to the tonic if the tonic were F? Well, of course, thinking about that for a second, I realize that I'm going to need a C major chord, right? And a C major chord serves as a five within the context of F, okay? So let me go ahead and spell that chord. Maybe I could put a C here, again, root to root. And since I already have a C in the tenor, maybe I'll double the root here, okay? Since the uh, alto is doubling the root of the F chord here, maybe I will treat that with a temporary leading tone, okay? And then the only thing I'm missing right now is a chordal fifth, a G, okay? So maybe that can go in the soprano. Now, let's pause for a second, because when, when, when we're doing a chord like this, if I think back to my original key, my original key is in fact C major. So how can I really make the C major chord, which in the original key is a tonic, how can I make it sound like a secondary dominant uh, to, to a four chord, or in this case to F? Well, that's one of the advantages of using seventh chords, because if I were to spell this as a five seven chord, right, now, what, watch what happens. I'm actually going to need a member of this chord that does not belong to the key of C because a C major chord that's a, that's a major minor seventh requires a C, which I already have, an E, a G, but then also a B flat. Okay, so maybe if I use a B flat somewhere in this chord, that'll convince the ear a little bit more that I'm really not just rearticulating the tonic triad of my original key of C, but that I'm really trying to trying to outline a, a secondary dominant relative to the F chord. So let's see, where's a good place for that B flat? Well, it seems that the logical place would be the soprano because a B flat as the chordal seventh would need to resolve down. Okay, and, and it would resolve down to A, which is the note I have here in the soprano. So if I do that, replace the G in the soprano with a B flat, okay? The nice thing is I do have a complete 5-7 chord, but notice that in the process of doing that, I've eliminated the fifth, okay? So this is one of those instances where I have an incomplete 5-7 chord. So now I've imported that uh, dominant chord of, of F, which is our four chord here, into the texture. And so, so these are the same notes I came up with, right? The B flat and the soprano, which actually seems to work well because it really just acts as kind of a passing tone between the C and the A. Uh, but then look what I've done here. I, I've had an alto, I've had the alto leap down to an E before coming back up to an F. I've had the tenor leap down to a C before sustaining over, okay, and, and the bass kind of stays as a common tone. Now, I mean, this is, I mean, it's doable, but it may not be the smoothest thing in the world. Let, let, let's see if you agree. I'll play that for us.
So to my ear, I mean, that sounds okay, but I can't help but wonder if there, if there wouldn't be a smoother way to do that, especially since the underlying triad, right, a C major chord, right, going to a C7 chord, you would think it would have a whole lot of common tones. So, so I wonder if there's not a way to smooth that out, at least in the upper voices. Well, what if I did this? What, what if I moved some of the furniture around and I actually gave myself the opportunity to both smooth out the voices and give myself a complete chord? What if, instead of the bass holding the root, what if the bass kind of have smoother transition into the F by going to the third of this chord? And then that would make sense with the tenor because that would allow for a simple voice exchange here. Of course, it would also require a move in the alto, which has the third here, right? We don't want to double the third. So maybe what the alto can do is simply go up to the fifth, which actually had been omitted in our previous version of this chord. Okay, and so now what I have is I actually have a complete chord. And it's a complete, if I'm thinking of it in, in terms of the F major chord, it's a five, six, five of an F chord. Well, what is F in the key of C? It's a four chord. So I would call this a five, six, five of four. So let's see how this one sounds. So to my ear, that actually sounds pretty good as well. Um, I don't know that I would say that it's necessarily better or smoother sounding than the previous option. Uh, the previous option where I was in a root position, five, seven, of four, uh, with an omitted fifth, so an incomplete chord. Uh, that, you know, certainly had some jumping around and things, but it didn't sound necessarily any worse than what I have here. What I will say is I like here, uh, in, in this option, that I have the opportunity for a little bit more interesting bass line, right? So by, by, by having a small leap up to the E and then stepping into the four chord before coming down to the uh, five seven of five and then up here to me that gives a little more contour a little bit more interest to the bass let's say that i wanted to keep this progression going right i could certainly you know just kind of go with what i have here which results in an imperfect authentic cadence going from a five or five seven to one uh, with something other than the tonic and the top voice of the in the top voice of the texture right that's a nice incomplete authentic cadence but let's say i wanted to make this thing go a little longer well one of the best ways to to extend a progression of when, when, when you kind of get to this dominant area would be to have a deceptive resolution so going to a six chord and then kind of letting it go from there so let's go ahead and do a deceptive resolution just so i can show how we can use secondary dominance to highlight that six as well. I'll approach this one a little bit differently by kind of just, you know, kind of plopping it right in the progression here rather than doing it in the abstract first. And that's because when we get to the six chord, something's going to be different uh, than the way we've been treating deceptive resolution so far. So I'll go ahead and get rid of this one chord because I want to go to a six chord instead. And I just want to kind of give myself room to put in the secondary dominance. So I'm going to put a label for the six way over here. Okay. And I know that within the key of C, uh, a, a sixth chord is actually an A minor triad, which means I'll need to lead to an A, a C, and an E. Okay. So within the key of A minor, if, if I'm kind of treating that as my temporary goal here, I have to think for a second to recognize that, oh, in order to get to a secondary dominant or a five or five seven of six, that actually requires an E major seven chord. Okay. So that's an E7 chord, which I'll spell using an E, a G sharp, a B, and a D. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to spell the secondary dominant first just to see how we can use that to resolve to our sixth chord. Okay. So let's see how I could uh, just kind of go straight through uh, and, and, and resolve right from my original five chord to a five seven of six. First thing I want to do, because uh, this five chord matures to a five seven, I want to make sure that I take care of the, 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 the chordal seven and allow that to resolve down, okay? Which is convenient because that happens to be one of the pitches that I'm going to need for this chord. Uh, and, and just before I get too carried away, let me go ahead and make sure that I've doubled the root in the bass as well, okay? So that takes care of both instances of the E that I would need. Okay, and um, I, I do want to take a look to, to see if I have any common tones that I can carry over. Uh, and if I do that, then I'll notice that I could carry the D in the alto as a chordal seventh uh, in, in, in the five seven, just kind of hold that there. And I could also carry the B 
as a common tone here. Uh, the problem though is that if I do that, then I'm actually gonna have uh, an improperly incomplete 5-7 chord because I will have omitted the chordal third. And I do wanna make sure that I have that third. Well, the best candidate for getting to the third, uh, the G sharp here, is actually going to be the tenor. So rather than have the tenor carry over the B, I'm gonna have the tenor go ahead and head down to the G sharp here. Okay, and then I think I can safely keep my alto note and have that tie over as the chordal seventh. Okay, so that takes care of the G sharp, that takes care of the D. Notice that I have an omitted B, but as we've already, as we've learned from previous study of five, seven chords, we can actually omit the fifth if needed. Of course, omitting the fifth here means I'm probably gonna end up with a complete six chord, right? Because remember, an incomplete dominant leads to a complete tonic. And we're not, we're, obviously the six isn't a tonic, but it's kind of the temporary uh, goal of this five, seven chord. So let's see how that plays out. Okay, my bass will go here. And notice I've taken it down to the lower A rather than up to the upper A. If I take it to the upper A, that's gonna give us a voice overlap at the tenor. So I'll go ahead and resolve the bass down. The tenor has the leading tone, we'll resolve the leading tone up. Okay, the chordal seventh and the alto should resolve down by step. And the soprano gets to maintain a common tone. Okay, so let's see what that sounds like. Now, one thing I want us to be thoughtful of, uh, you, you may recall from our previous study of deceptive resolutions that the voice leading, uh, the, the voice leading tendencies when we're leaving a five or a five seven chord uh, from our original key end up dictating that a deceptive six chord will have a doubled third. Right, because because the, the the deception is kind of happening in the bass in those instances, and the voice leading tendencies of the upper voices will allow a doubling of the tonic pitch, which in the sixth chord is the, is the chordal third. Right. Well, that changes a little bit now because I'm using the dominant of that sixth chord, and, and I'm and by using normal dominant resolution in the context of six, I actually end up with a more traditional doubling of the chordal root. So now I'd like you to give this a try. Uh, you see I have two kind of blank chords here uh, as, as I work to fill out my progression here. Uh, I'd like you to use a secondary dominant to get into what I've created here in terms of a two six chord, right? And then use another secondary dominant to get into this cadential six four chord. Remember cadential six four of course is, is part of uh, the part of a five motion. So you're probably your hint is you're gonna use something of five uh, in the second chord here. And I've given you a, a, another hint here in terms of looking at the bass motion. Notice I've used bass motion that allows for really smooth uh, kind of a contour here in the bass. So see if you can create uh, some secondary dominance uh, of your own kind of using the process that we've talked about up until now. So here's what I came up with uh, in, in this first chord. I went ahead and used a 5-4-2 of 2, uh, and that allowed for some really smooth motion in all the voices, really. In the uh, soprano, I have a common tone, as well as in the tenor, right? In the alto, it's not a common tone, but it really is just kind of a chromatic passing tone, really, just kind of a half-step motion, causing that uh, a leading tone here in the alto, resolving to the D, okay? And the bass, again, the, the, the goal was to, to have really nice smooth motion in the bass, so I accomplished that as well. And this makes sense because Remember, thinking of the two six as a temporary goal or a temporary, uh, you know, semi kind of a tonic sort of thing. A four two chord really should resolve to the quote unquote the tonics uh, first inversion triad, which is what I've done with the two here. Okay, so and then in the next chord, I've chosen a five six five a five. And that again allows for some uh, common tone motion in the alto, right? Uh, one thing you might notice is that I actually had the soprano jump from the F to an A, even though I already had an A in the tenor, right? So why didn't I just carry that through as a common tone? Well, I, I, I realized that I wanted to be able to double uh, the fifth in my cadential six four, and an easy way to do that would be to have the soprano make a leap. But the other thing that accomplishes, maybe even more important, it allows the tenor to kind of get into this seventh uh, using some appoggiatura like motion, right? So it kind of it jumps into the seventh. It sticks around, but only for the purpose of of kind of helping out with the six four chord before resolving down uh, uh, down stepwise. Okay, so that's how I accomplished uh, this voice leading here. So let's hear what this whole thing now sounds like. 